it says January 14th. Okay, well, welcome to Midpoint. Today is the third session in our series, Islam, the Middle East, and current events. And uh, the first two weeks, we touched on pretty difficult topics, as this entire 
um, discussion over three weeks of a horrible situation in the Middle East. It's not easy to uh, sort through, and all the cultures, the races, various religions involved in this conflict, uh, it's not easy stuff. And uh, I, as I've done preparing for this message, each and every day is asking God for direction and guidance. So let's go to God uh, before we begin and ask for his blessing upon this talk. Heavenly Father, we love you. We come before you. We thank you for the gifts you give us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to have a heart for those involved in the conflict in the Middle East, for both Jew and Muslim, for Palestinian and Israeli, sorting through the difficulty of the situation and uh, not breaking from uh, compassion and care for people who you love dearly, made in your image. I pray for guidance in our discussion today and that we would have a heart of empathy. But Lord, I pray we would also hold to the truth because you are... You are truth and love, and uh, we don't want to break from either one. Help us to navigate the waters with the heart of your Son, our Savior, and Holy Spirit. Guide our our conversation uh, so that it would be uh, edifying to each and every person who watches this and for all of us trying to grow closer to you. We pray this all in Christ's perfect name. Amen. Okay. So we're going to look at the historical context of this current war. And, but before we do that, I want to remi- uh, remind all of us, I have to remind myself, because it's so easy to get caught up in the politics and everything, but we've got to remember that Jesus Christ is the answer for Jew and Muslim, once again, Arab and Israeli, battling this out. They need Jesus Christ. The Gentile nations of this world need Jesus Christ. And... Uh, he, we, knowing he is the answer, giving that how we can and how uh, we're called to is what, once again, I remind myself of regularly, uh, but we also are called to stand up against evil, and we need wisdom in trying to define what evil is. God has outlined in his holy word what the truth is and what evil is. When we identify it, we have to stand up against it. Not easy, right? Right? Uh, week one, we looked at Islam's beliefs and how it emerged in the in the uh, sixth century, seventh century, and uh, looked at the whole concept of holy war, jihad, and what that means. And we looked at the common beliefs with this monotheistic religion of Islam, along with the beliefs of monotheism in Judaism and Christianity. So. Uh, we, we learned a lot uh, last week. Dave brought us through um, what, it, what a theocracy is, God ruling directly over the nations, and how that was the economy of God's dealing with the people of the Old Testament, the Jews, under uh, his direct leadership and then under the rulership of a king and so on. And there has not been a theocracy, God ruling over the nation of Israel for millennia, Right? Christianity has never had a theocracy, and it is, in Scripture, we are uh, clearly identified as the body of Christ to bring the good news of Jesus, having nothing to do with direct rulership over the nations. And, um, we, you know, we study Scripture on a regular basis to try and understand that. Islam, at its core, is trying to be the dominant religion of the world. As is Christianity, but once again, the approach is different. Uh, since Christ, you know, Christians have made mistakes, whether it's the Crusaders or the Inquisition or what have you, but the charge of the New Testament is to bring the truth of Jesus Christ and allow people to receive that or reject that. And by no compulsion are we to try to convert. Uh, with Islam, there are some within Islam that want to spread Islam by force. And we won't go into the history, that was week number two. And so that is part of what is being, uh, we're trying to sort through in the Middle East today, okay? What uh, definition of Islam today within Palestine, okay? The area of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip where the conflict's going on down in the southern portion of Israel and, and Gaza. What are the rights of the Palestinians? 
Are they truly a people? We talked about passports last week, right? And what does that really mean to have a passport? And does it carry any, uh, any weight in, along with the nations of the world? Well, I want to look a little bit of that within the context of not ancient, ancient history, but the last few centuries, okay? So we're going to start with this. I'm going to pick up in the 1500s, and I'm going to jump right to the late 1800s very quickly. Uh, we covered the ancient, uh, uh, the, the uh, Abrahamic covenant, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Abraham and, and is Ishmael as is Islam holds. We covered that already, and I'm not going to go through all that. I'm not going to go through the monarchy with King David and all the way up to the time of Christ and the centuries following, or even Islam established in the early 600s A.D. and what all happened there up through the establishing of Islam in the Middle East, in Israel, Jerusalem, and the Crusades and all of that. We've, we've touched on that, but today I'm going to get up to the 1500s when the Turkish Ottoman Empire took control, okay, and that's an Islamic caliphate, took control of Israel, and this is the empire, as you can see, of the Ottoman Turks and Jerusalem, Israel, right in the middle of that. They had control uh, for 400 years, 1517 to 1917. And incidentally, for a lot of that period, Jews were allowed to live in the land. They were spread out. You had one event I will refer back to is AD 70 is the di diaspora, or diaspora, however you choose to pronounce it. And that was the spreading of the Jews, the scattering of the Jews. And I'll talk more about that at the very end. So Jerusalem, controlled by the Ottoman Turks for 400 years. And we then move up to the late 1800s. And you had the Russian pogroms. A pogrom is a state-sanctioned persecution of a people. And one of the tenets of my talk today is that the Jews are the most persecuted people in all of history. And that is because of a spiritual war going on behind the scenes. And I'll talk more about that. But they were living in Europe, Asia, uh, up into Russia. And all of these areas that the Jews were living in were suffering persecution. Middle Ages, uh, sometimes at the hands of Muslims, sometimes at the hands of Christians, sometimes at the hands of various Gentile nations, okay? And th this picture here is Fiddler on the Roof, Tevia, uh, hauling his cart and the family fo following behind, and they're leaving Russia because they're being persecuted by the government. So as they flee, they want to flee to Europe, they're trying to flee some to America, and they want to also return to the ancient land of Israel, of which they've been out of the land at this point about 1,900 years, um, and actually 1,800 years at, at this point. So in America, uh, when the Jews arrived, what could they do? Well, they wanted to get educated because in Europe, what they suffered during the persecution, um, 15, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, they weren't allowed quite often to be citizens of whatever particular nation they were in. And they were given the menial or the despised tasks that nobody else wanted. One was to sell rags and tied to clothing. And number two was usury was money lending for interest. And that was looked down upon, um, frowned upon by many people, and was something that the Jews were relegated to. Well, when they came to America, what did they do? They knew banking, so they went into banking. And once again, banking did not have the prestigious, um, you know, respect that it has today. But back then, and once again, it was despised. But they learned the banking, and also... Uh, haberdashery. They went into tailoring, selling clothing, okay? And that's, that's what took place as they made their way over here into the West, into America and Canada and other places. Where they really wanted to return was to their homeland. So as the pogroms took place, the persecution under the hands of the Russian government, and they left, they arrived in Israel. And as they arrived in Israel, 
they returned, and there was already a small contingent of Jews there. There were Jew and Arab living side by side uh, pretty much peacefully during that time. But the Jews under the persecution in Russia were returning, and they were returning to a land that was, uh, w- was in very bad shape. The, it was basically a swamp-infested, or a malaria-infested swampland. And they, <laughs> they realized, okay, this is our homeland. What, what are we going to do? Well, we want to take care of it. What was taking place is absentee landlords under the Ottoman Turks, okay? They had no g- real great desire other than Jerusalem, where the Dome of the Rock was and the mosque and, and all of that. They didn't really care about the rest of Israel. And absentee landlords in that region were taxing the people who lived there, and they would tax them based on the number of trees that they had on their land. So what are you going to do? Well, I want lower taxes. You chop down the trees. And those trees were also sold to fuel the locomotive, Oriental Express, and all of these things that were going on at that time. So as the Jews returned to the swampland, and uh, because the topsoil is washed away when the trees aren't there, and the land was just not in good shape, they realized, okay, this is going to be our homeland, we're, you know, our ancient homeland we're returning to. We need to start buying the land and fix it up. Well, the absentee landlords were happy to sell them land. So Jews were buying land, and they started to plant trees and drain the water out of the swamps. They brought in eucalyptus trees from Australia, and it soaked up large amounts of water, and eventually the land started to flourish. And people started to see the worth of the land and then began to contest over it. But they made it livable. They made it a desirable place to be. And they began to come back in numbers as they flew, uh, fled from the uh, Russian persecution. So as the, as the Jews, newspaper reporter, a playwright, and he's watching the increase in anti-Semitism. People were being wrongfully accused of crimes and who were Jewish, not able to defend themselves. And even the truth may come out later. He was seeing this repeated over and over in Europe. So as the anti-Semitism increased, he realized he needed to say something about it. So he began to write multiple articles and reports that were published, and he wrote a brochure calling for the homeland for the Jew. He wanted a Jewish safe haven for his people. He was opposed, ironically enough, he was opposed by the Jews who were living there. For the most part, the Jews, you know, as they're traversing Europe and they're looking down into Israel, you know, things are pretty good over here in Germany. Things are pretty good over here across the ocean in America. Leave things alone. I know there was anti-Semitism in Russia, but for the most part, it's, it, the dust is settled. Leave things alone. So he was opposed by many fellow Jews at that time. Bible-believing Christians supported him. And they were the ones, Moody Bible Institute went on record early on supporting a homeland for the Jews. And when they became a nation in 1948, which we will get to, they were one of the institutions that were supporting Theodore Herzl and others. But Theodore Herzl was not making a lot of headway with his own people. So that's 1897. Events of the world continue to unfold, and we arrive at World War I, 1914 to 1918. Key event that took place during World War I, as the Central Powers and the Axis Powers fought, Germany, Austria, and Turkey uh, were the Central Powers, and then you had the United States, you had primarily Britain and France doing the majority of the fighting. Uh, the United States did not join the war till later, uh, not in 1914, they were 1917. And it was um, a, a area of Content, you know what what land was battled for during that time um, at <laughs> obviously this is going on over in Europe in Germany but there were battles going on in Jerusalem okay and as you know in World War II this all dropped down into northern Africa and this was why why what, why do they care about Jerusalem 
the battle's going on over in Europe. Well, Britain, as they're battling back and forth from continent to continent and making their way into Jerusalem, they captured Jerusalem from the Ottoman Turks. They now, Great Britain now had control of Jerusalem for the first time in 400 years. It was no longer in the Turkish Empire's hands, okay, the Ottoman Turks. And they were, they were slowly dissolving in World War I, seemed to put an end to that. 400 years, you now had Jerusalem, Israel's capital, in the hands of somebody else other than the Turks. Well, 1917, other key events going on. A very famous movie that um, most of us who are older have heard of or have seen. And Lawrence of Arabia, this is Peter O'Toole, who was the actor and, um, in, in the film. And the real Lawrence of, uh, of Arabia is over here on your left as you look at this. Britain, in the area of the Middle East during World War I was looking for Arabs to help support them in the battle going on in the European theater and down into the Mediterranean area. And so British officer, Lawrence of Arabia as he's called, sought out the help of the Arabs in that area and they helped fight along and defeat the Central Powers, right? So Britain was indebted to those Arabs. And you can see on this map here that Israel and Jordan are outlined there. And this was something called the British Mandate that was all tied to these events of World War I, whether it was capturing Jerusalem, the British, or the British having the Arabs help fight alongside. And since they were indebted, they, they knew there was a call for a homeland, so they started to draw up plans that Israel would have this area, and Jordan, at that time called Transjordan, would have that area marked on the map. You can see Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Syria to the north, okay? So that, that was being outlined during that time due to events going on uh, with World War I. Well, another major event took place, and that was the Balfour Declaration, which tied to the British mandate, okay, the support of the British for the Jew to have a homeland and to help support those Arabs that they were indebted to, okay, who helped fight alongside. What it says on the screen there, the key part is that Lord Arthur James Balfour, His Majesty's government, the, uh, the British government, view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. That's part of what was written in there. So they outlined the map, British mandate, of what the area was going to be like when they divided it. Well, the Jordans, tra Transjordan at that time, area began to be settled by Arabs, okay? Uh, and Jews continued to live in the land of Israel, but as political realities go, Israel was not given the land at that time, but Jordan was given to the people uh, that they were indebted to. So as more and more consideration is being given to establishing a homeland for the Jew, and, and also, once again, for the Arab the, in, in Jordan. Uh, other events took place in, at the end of World War I. 1917, Heim Wiseman, brilliant Jewish scientist, a brilliant chemist, uh, was called upon by the British. The Allied forces in 1917 were running out of explosives, and they called on Heim Wiseman to figure out some type of synthetic explosive for them. So he rolled up his sleeves, he went into the lab, worked endlessly. Uh, they say days, weeks, almost exclusively working, hardly sleeping at all, and staying with it because they needed these explosives as soon as possible. Well, he came up 
with a cordite. It was an explosive propellant that helped change the course of the war at that time. Okay, And he was instrumental to equipping the Allies with explosives to finally bring World War I to, uh, uh, to an end. Once again, Britain was indebted to the Arabs who fought along with Lawrence of Arabia in World War I. And so, too, now the British were indebted to the Jews because of the efforts of Heim Wiseman and others. Incidentally, Heim Wiseman would become prime minister of Israel at a future point. So those are all the factors that are playing into this. I mean, you've got all of these different balancing of peoples that Great Britain's trying to officiate, trying to rule over, right? The Ottoman Turks are pretty much out of the picture now. And Turkey, in modern day Turkey, it's kind of pulled back to there. And the British now are controlling that whole section of what is today called Israel and was ancient, uh, anciently called Israel. And of course, before Israel became a nation in 1948, in that time period, it was called Palestine. We talked a little bit about that last week. Well, Jews continued to return back to the land, okay? Perse uh, persecution is still there. Anti-Semitism is still on the rise in Europe. Um, how many are still leaving from Russia is not clear, but anti-Semitism is on the rise in Europe, and they're leaving, coming to what they want to be their returning to what they say is their ancient homeland and outlined in Scripture as the, the, the land of Canaan, the land of Judea, the land of Israel. 1922, so 1917, 1918, World War I ends, and now, once again, the Jews are returning to the land, and the League of Nations uh, has been formed and is trying to adjudicate this land. So you had the British mandate in 1917, and they were going to use the principles of that to outline this area that they were going to go ahead and give to uh, the Jews. And once again, much of Transjordan was already being settled. It was just being formalized. Okay. At that time in 1922, and this is one of the core things I want to say about this, uh, the, all these events and how they tie together. In 1922, the Muslim Brotherhood was formed. They are uh, an Islamic terrorist group. And there was frustration they had with the Jews returning to the land in higher and bigger numbers, and they didn't want that many Jews in the land. So they began to uh, commit terrorist acts against people who was, and once again, as far as I can tell from history, there was a lot of peace in that area in the, eight, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, between Arab and Jew neighbor living in, in, in that area of Palestine, what we call Israel. And uh, Muslim Brotherhood was going to put a stop to that. They wanted to eliminate any Jewish presence in that area. Okay, This plays into... Uh, a lot of the events of today, because that has been the repeated pattern for at least since 1922. So you're talking 100 years of this, where Islamic jihadist groups not only don't want the Jews to be in Jerusalem and Israel, but they want to annihilate them and drive them out of there. Once again, I mentioned it last week, one of the things you've seen at the protests are the signs from the river to the sea. They want to drive the Jews from the Jordan River, which is the uh, eastern side of Jerusalem. They want to drive them from the Jordan River in to, to the west, into the Mediterranean Sea. And that, that's exactly what it, um, the Muslim Brotherhood was talking about. And you'll see in some of these later military conflicts that that was uh, also reiterated multiple times. So political realities are that Israel still is not and they, they established Jordan, okay? Jordan is a nation today, once again called Transjordan at that time. But that was established, but because of the balancing and the pressure Britain was under, they still had not followed through with the, uh, with the British mandate. So, 
You have the events. We already talked about Russian po pogroms in the late 1880s, uh, in the 1880s up through, through the uh, l late part of the 19th century. We turn over in the 20th century and anti-Semitism now is rising in Europe, and here we are in the 30s, okay? And we all know what took place there. Jewish persecution is rising in Germany. No longer could the Jew um, have, once again, be part of civil service. Um, they, their businesses were being boycotted, and you had the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party. And uh, they began to flee in greater numbers, heading to wherever they could, okay? Other parts of Europe, trying to go to Canada, the United States, trying to get down to Australia, trying to get wherever they could go. And many of them wanted to return back to Israel at that time called the land of Palestine, okay? And as these ships came in, the frustration of some of the Arabs, like the Muslim Brotherhood, began to increase. And there was more and more tension and more and more conflict. Well, as they, they fled, and then you had the great event, um, the horrific event, but very notable event, of Kristallnacht, 1938, and the Night of Broken Glass. And you had a declaration at that time that Germany was now going to all out persecute the Jews. The writing was on the wall. Uh, and Jews were fleeing as much as they could at that time. But now it was going to get much more difficult, 1938, 39, and through the early 40s until World War II would end in 1945. This next slide is a very difficult thing that um, a, a, an alliance that took place that if you study it as objectively as you can, I think there's a lot of truth to it. Adolf Hitler hosting the, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem in 1941 in Germany. Okay? Haj Amin al Husseini was the Grand Mufti and for, for a few decades there in, in Palestine. And as he came to see what Hitler was doing, I hate to say it, but they had a common goal, and that was to eliminate the Jews. And that is a driving force into Israel proclaiming their independence as quickly as they could post-World War II. But here is 1941. So you're getting to the height of World War I, excuse me, II. Height of World War II and the concentration camps and the death camps are now growing into full swing, right? And uh, Jews are being murdered by the hundreds of thousands into the millions. And in Jerusalem, uh, the Grand Mufti was committed to eliminating the Jews there as well. There was no systematized government that he could do that by. He was the ruler of the Arab people, primarily through an Islamic uh, connection, you know, as their religious leader. Uh, but they didn't have the means that Hitler had at, at his disposal. So some of these things were carried out through various terrorist attacks. Well... This persecution took place 20s, 30s, 40s, and early 50s as the Grand Mufti ruled over that area. And the Jews suffered immensely in Jerusalem. And of course, as we well know, Hitler implemented the final solution. There are writings where um, the Grand Mufti fully agreed with the plans of Hitler and his final solution to eliminate the Jews. Um, so a, a very evil alliance. There's no other way to put it. And as the war began to, you know, ramp up in Europe to its climax in 1945, the Jews were being equipped by some of the British soldiers in Israel on how to fight. They weren't a formalized people either. They didn't have a military or anything. Um, and they were equipped by some soldiers such as Ord Wingate, a major general in the British Army. Father of the Israel Defense Forces is what Israel titled him. He was a British soldier, a British le uh, military strategist, very, very intelligent, and uh, he equipped the Israelis to defend themselves, and he's said to have carried a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other. I don't know what that says exactly. Um, if you read his writings, he was a devout follower of God and wanted to share the love and mercy of Christ, but he also wanted people to be able to defend themselves. 
okay? So he took that, uh, he had an understanding of the millennia old persecution the Jews had, and he wanted them to be equipped to defend themselves. Not to be the aggressors, but to defend themselves. So as the Jews are, are, are growing in uh, their, getting organized and, and growing in their uh, numbers in the Middle East in the 30s and early 40s, okay, in the land of Palestine, not called Israel yet. It was <laughs> millennia ago, right? World War II is coming to an end, and, uh, but, but the British are still, during this time, okay, they're still trying to navigate the tensions of the Arabs and the Jews in the area that I showed you with the map of Transjordan and, and Israel. And so they came out in 1939 with something called the British White Papers. I mean, you can see right there, it's titled Palestine. So that area was called Palestine, I mean, very clearly. And what the British did is they limited the immigration into that area, into Palestine, to 75,000 people per year for the next five years, and then they would go ahead and, with the Arab majority, they would reevaluate it. Well, 1939, the Jews are fleeing for their lives from Hitler and the Nazis, and the reality was that much less than 75,000 per year were able to make it into Israel, okay? Not only that, the Jews at that time were being limited by the very, very strict immigration quotas by Canada, the United States, Australia, other nations they were trying to get to. So they really had nowhere to go. Well, once again, they had that balancing of Heim Wiseman, the Jew who would help them with the explosive problem they had. You had the Arabs who fought alongside Lawrence of Arabia. So the British had obligations to both sides, and they were... They were really struggling with that, uh, how, to, uh, you know, how to implement this land for the Jews, and it, it obviously was not a reality at that time. So, World War II comes to an end. The truth of the Holocaust trickles out, and we know that six million Jews died in the Holocaust, and uh, Hitler killed many millions of other people uh, for other, whether it's political dissidents, whether it was gypsies, whether it was the mentally handicapped, whether it was homosexuals, whether it was Jehovah's Witnesses, whatever his reasons were, whether it was faithful uh, clergy in the Catholic Church or Lutheran Church or wh whoever else who stood up to him, Dietrich Bonhoeffer would be one who sacrificed his life. Speaking, So all of these who spoke against Hitler or went up against him were eliminated, and his unholy hatred for the Jews was played out. And one of the things, you know, it's interesting that if you, if you study something in Christianity like the resurrection and how different theories about the resurrection decades after the time of Christ surfaced to where people could go ahead and try and deny the resurrection, and one of the things you learn is it takes a generation, 40 years, for a myth to grab hold and to start to have legs and people start to believe it. And how interesting the Holocaust deniers started coming out in the book with books in the 80s and 90s, okay, about 40 years after the time of the Holocaust to deny the Holocaust. One of the people who denied the Holocaust is the current president of the Palestinians. Let's see, you've got the West Bank, you've got Gaza if you look on a map, and it was Yasser Arafat who ruled over them for a long time, as seen as their leader. And then the current one is Mahmoud Abbas. And in his doctoral thesis, he wrote uh, against Zionism and against the Jew, specifically about then how uh, fascism and, and socialism and Nazism all played into that. There are different aspects to his uh, doctoral thesis. But one of them clearly marginalized the Holocaust. At, at the least, it marginalized it. At the most, it denied it. Okay, you can debate what that is. <clears throat> In 2023, he was lambasted by the world, and you can you can see this in the AP. Uh, go ahead and look it up and find it on all of the different wires. Um, he basically said 
you know what? Hitler and, and commended or at least agreed that Hitler was eliminating the Jews because they were guilty of usury. We talked about that before. Money lending. They were guilty of banking in the, in, in the form where it was high interest and it was seen as despicable. He actually uh, had those comments where, where he, was, he was condemned uh, roundly for it because of the anti-Semitic uh, tone of it and outright you know, support of what Hitler was doing. So that is the leader of the Palestinian people. Well, how are they supposed to sort through this? This is their leader saying these things. It's going to be have an impact about how you treat your neighbor, right? Okay, so now the sympathies of the world are taking place for the Jews. The horrors of the Holocaust are coming out. And the Jews are making their way back to Palestine, to Israel. They want to establish their homeland. They want a safe place. There was nothing left for them in Europe. Where could they go? And it was a major trip to get, if they get to the United States, great. They, they, many came to the United States and wanted to settle here. And many settled in New York, here in Chicagoland, settled in Skokie, and uh, a very large contingent of Jews in those areas. They wanted a safe place to be, and one of the places they wanted to get back to was Israel. And so as they're leaving, making their trips, the white papers were still in effect from, from, uh, from Great Britain. So they were limiting how many Jews could come in. And numbers, droves of Jews were coming in on ships from Europe down through the Mediterranean and arriving at the shores of Israel. Okay, And British would, the British would turn away the ships. And they would intern the passengers on these ships on the island of Cyprus. It was not a concentration camp or a work camp, but it was a camp. And they were interned there uh, until Britain could figure out what to do with them. Well, this happened time and time again until the ship Exodus. 1947, um, the British see this ship coming, and they say, turn back. We're going to board you and force you to leave. <clears throat> the passengers, the captain of the ship, say, if you board us, we'll blow up the ship. Everybody on the ship will die. We're, we're not being turned away. The British said, okay, we won't board you, but we won't let you in. So the passengers, captain of the ship said, okay, we only have limited food supplies and medical supplies. People are going to begin to die if you leave us out here. And as the, as the people die, we'll throw the bodies overboard for the world to see. Once again, context, World War II is over. The horrors of the Holocaust are coming out, and sympathies for the Jewish community are very high at that time. So the British uh, didn't know what to do. They'd had enough. And don't forget, there were over 100,000 troops, British troops stationed in Israel at that time, many of them in Jerusalem. They said, we've had enough. And they turned over Palestine to the United Nations. The United Nations just formed at the end of World War II, okay? And so the Jews started to come in, started ignoring the immigration of the white papers and were arriving in larger numbers in the land of Israel, what was at that point called Palestine. So you have the tensions in Jerusalem be continuing to rise because more and more Jews are there. And you had the Muslim Brotherhood and others who were saying, we don't want the Jews here. And uh, it started to become clear that they were going to declare themselves a nation. Okay? And the Jewish leaders, once again, not a formalized nation at that point, the Jewish leaders were reaching out to the nations of the world to help back them in establishing uh, their statehood, their nationhood. Okay? <clears throat> Britain is part of the United Nations, but they're out of direct control. And so people began to appeal to the United States. And Harry Truman was president at that time. And Harry Truman was 
he was non-committal on the nation of Israel at that time. His U.S. State Department was telling him, do not support Israel becoming a nation. The ambassador for the, uh, of the United States to the U.N. was saying to Truman, do not back Israel to become a nation. The Pentagon, all of them were saying this is a terrible idea. It's going to backfire. They're going to be a stillborn nation. They're going to die uh, with the, the surrounding nations are going to eliminate them. And Harry Truman, once again, was trying to weigh what the political consequences could be. Well, as history would have it, uh, Harry Truman <clears throat> was a haberdasher. He sold men's clothing, and he owned a clothing store along with his partner, who was Jewish, of course. And his Jewish friend came to his former business partner, Harry Truman, and pled with him to back the nation of Israel when they, when they, stay, when they proclaim their independence. He was noncommittal in the conversation, uh, but shortly thereafter, he told his, uh, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, he, Harry Truman said, we are going to throw our full support behind Israel becoming a nation. <clears throat> the United Nations approves the vote takes place, and they approve the partitioning of Palestine, okay? Israel r raises a flag, and they now know that they can, the, the time in history is there. After almost 2,000 years of being on the land, they can go ahead, <coughs> excuse me, and, and proclaim themselves a nation again. What Israel was promised in 1917, British mandate, was now going to become a reality. Don't forget, Jordan, that area that was promised to the Arabs, was, was well settled by the people living there and was, was a nation. Well, the surrounding Arab nations said, if Israel declares themselves a nation, we will drive them into the Mediterranean Sea. And this is the land that was defined by the UN, the partition plan, okay? All of that in blue is what was gonna be the Jewish state. What's here in this pinkish orange and then uh, green is what was going to be assigned for the Arab state. And what was in this um, kind of grayish and pink was Jerusalem. And that was going to be um, watched over by basically the UN. They were going to have control of it. So Israel accepted the deal. They said, okay, it's not what we were promised, but we'll take it. The Arab community flat out rejected it. The next day, not the next day, shortly thereafter, in 1948, May 14th, 1948, Israel was declared a nation. David Ben-Gurion, with the picture of Theodore Herzl from 1897 in the background, declared Israel a nation from the city of Tel Aviv. And uh, they, he saw this as the moment that they had to take, uh, capture because it would probably not come again. So those are the events that are taking place right before Israel declared themselves a nation. And I mean, not right before, but leading up to that, 1947 to early 1948, the Palestinians see this event as absolutely catastrophic. The catastrophe, the Nakba, okay? Palestinian Nakba before and after the war, or excuse me, before and after uh, the date of May 14th. Here's what took place. Palestinians fled, number one, for legitimate reasons. War was coming, okay? And, they, you know, men, women, children, mostly women and children fled. They left, and they headed into what was the area of Jordan and into uh, Egypt, okay? And as they're doing this, they're being told, number two, by Egypt and other, some of the other nations, Israel declares himself a nation. We're going to drive them into the Mediterranean Sea in one week. We will completely eliminate them. Then you can return back to your land and not only have your land, but your neighbor's land who has been eliminated, who has been annihilated, who has been pushed into the Mediterranean Sea. That is, as you'll see, not how it turned out. May 15, 1948, the day after Israel declares herself a nation, 
Six nations attacked, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> Israel's a brand new nation. They have no standing military. They have some people trained, Ord Wingate and other British soldiers who trained them to some degree, but they didn't have a standing army with all the military equipment and munitions that they needed. They were completely outnumbered and outgunned. They didn't have planes, military planes to speak of. They had Piper Cubs, and they would make Molotov cocktails, and they would throw uh, those out the window of this little plane and hit some of the ships of the Egyptian armada making their way up. And uh, they were holding their own week by week and month by month. And Golda Meir, um, 1948, is watching the war unfold. And she is a Jewish uh, member of Israel, okay, of that newly formed nation. And she was trained, um, learned or, or her education in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She was a teacher in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, when she saw the plight of her fellow Jews, that's when she went back to Israel. And she was in David Ben-Gurion's uh, cabinet. And David Ben-Gurion would joke that uh, she was the best man he had in his cabinet because she had great negotiating skills and was, and was brilliant. She was sent out by David Ben-Gurion to go raise money. She came to Canada, came to the United States. She raised millions of dollars, and they brought that back, and they were able to buy military supplies. Israel survived that war, the War of Independence. It was over um, in 1949. There was a ceasefire, and then there was an uneasy peace, which we read about in the news every day today, right? You have ceasefires and all this back and forth. Well, the next major incursion was 1956. Uh, Nasser, the leader of Egypt, closed the Suez Canal. They were going to strangle Israel uh, economically. And uh, Israel rushed over to the Suez Canal, ended the blockade, and thus the Suez Canal crisis was ended. The next major incursion would be the Six-Day War in 1967. Israel knew she was about to be attacked again. And because is, uh, the Jews, once again, you know, I showed the map in the last couple of weeks, 9 million Jews approximately in the land of Israel. The surrounding Arab nations, 380 million. Okay? They've always been a smaller, read in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and Deuteronomy chapter 9. God said, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest. You were the fewest of all the peoples. And you're a stiff-necked people. Okay, and I'll read something in a moment about how God has used the Gentile nations. And maybe you look at Assyria and Babylon uh, to discipline the Jews. And it's, it's one of these mysteries that we could just not fathom how that has happened. It never, ever, ever justifies our anti-Semitism because we are held accountable for that. But Israel is accountable for their idolatry and abandoning God, okay? You read that throughout the scriptures over and over and over. Well, Israel being such a small people, they had the policy of preemptive strike. If they know they're going to be attacked, they have to attack first because they're too small to absorb an initial strike. So that was their policy in 1967. They knew they were going to be attacked by Egypt and some of the other nations. So they had a military at that point. Planes took off very uh, low to the, to the ground to avoid radar, and they fanned out, and they went ahead and struck the Egyptian and all of the other air forces. They were able to strike them while they were on the ground, and the six-day war began. It was probably over in a few hours. Um, so some of the largest tank battles uh, in history took place, some of them bigger than World War II. Well, another major event that takes place in 1967, is Israel captures Jerusalem, okay? Here they are at the Wailing Wall right there, and which is the wall of the temple that still stands from 2,000 years ago, okay? And they won the 1967 Six-Day War outright, and they had now captured Jerusalem, but there was immense pressure from the international community, including the United States, 
to give it back. They feared a major escalation, World War III maybe, was going to take place if they did not give back Jerusalem. You had the Temple Mount of Islam, you had the Al-Aqs Mosque of Islam, and it just wasn't going to stand. So they did give it back, and international uh, community w uh, had control. And you can look into that, how, it, how the uh, powers over the Temple Mount and over Jerusalem are, are divvied up. So last major military event I will cover, and then I'll close, is the 1973 war. Golda Meir, who I showed you before, she, 1947 or 1948, was going out and raising money uh, for the newly founded nation of Israel. And now she's the prime minister. And her Mossad, the, her intelligence agency, was warning her they were going to be attacked. They were even starting to pin down the day and or at least the general time period wi uh, within the month of October in 1973. Whatever the reasons were, they seemed to be puffed up with pride, and the leaders of Israel ignored it. And in 1973, surrounding Arab nations attacked, and they made major headway into Israel. Uh, the Yom Kippur War, because they attacked on the High Holy Day, while the Jews were observing their, uh, in the midst of religious observance, and they were caught totally off guard. They were losing badly. They were caught asleep at the switch. And uh, Egypt had, had come across with 2,200 ta tanks. Syria, up to 1,800 tanks. And, and tank battles bigger than 1967 and even World War II took place at that time. Well, Israel was able to catch her breath when the advancing forces stopped to re- supply to bring up more troops to bring up more supplies and they were able to mobilize because everybody in the uh in israel is in the army from the age of 18 to 55 and they can mobilize quickly so they mobilized their forces and uh they started to gain ground back but then they started to lose ground again and moshe diane one of the leaders the military leaders in israel went to golda meir and said the third temple is about to fall and what he was asking was permission to arm their nuclear weapons. We all know with the Cuban Missile Crisis, when President Kennedy was in office, we came very close to a nuclear war at that time. So too in 1973. Don't forget 1973 was the oil crisis. You had everything going on there, uh, which was all political in nature, right? And you had the Yom Kippur War. Well, Israel did not have to use their nuclear weapons, and neither did the warheads that Russia shipped down to Syria, did those get used, thankfully, and Israel ended up winning, the, the tide of battle shifted, and they ended up winning the 1973 war, miracle after miracle about how they survived. And that brings us to the story of today. The last 50 years have been the story of survival uh, for Israel no different than the previous three to 4,000 years. And, but I say again what I said earlier, I also don't forget about the plight of innocent people, Palestinians, who are suffering immensely at the hands of the Israeli military campaign that is taking place. It's a horrible situation. Understand one of the things Dave talked about last week is the Jews naturally isolate. Jews don't evangelize. They're not out spreading the gospel or spreading the, uh, of Christianity or the gospel of Islam, however you want to term it. They're not trying to spread their religion. They're isolationists because you are Jewish by your bloodline, as Dave has so clearly pointed out so many times. They want to live in their land that they were out of for 2,000 years. Now, we talked about a two-state solution. What does that really mean? Well, that's obviously what's been trying to be negotiated since the 1920s all the way to today, right? And 1917, the British mandate. And what has happened over and over and over and over again is the is Islamic jihadist groups want to, whether you are Muslim or Jewish, if you establish peace and try for a real two-state solution, however that would look, 
jihadist Islamic groups, Muslim Brotherhood, Fatah, all these other, the PLO, they will kill you. Anwar Sadat, leader of Egypt in 1981, brokered a peace deal. He was killed. And Yitzhak Rabin was killed, a Jewish leader, okay, leader of, of Israel, and he brokered a peace deal. And he was killed by a Jew who thought, what are you doing? You're giving away all the land. People killing their own leaders. But what has been standard practice, uh, which is one of the uh, reasons that Israel is striking back so hard with Hamas, is because the militant jihadist groups do not want the Jews there at all. Once again, from the river to the sea. Okay? Now, my heart goes out to all of the Jews who died on October 7th. Um, Jews who are still being held hostage and some American citizens who died as well as uh, are being still being held hostage. Don't forget, as of January 21st, 2024, there are still hostages being kept. And my heart goes out to those Palestinians who are dying in hospitals and other areas as Israel is rooting out Hamas from their underground tunnel system, whatever it is. It's a horrible situation. We can never forget that. So what can we do as Christians? We've got to understand as best we can the truth. And as I was talking with a couple of you this week, we also cannot depersonalize this. It's so easy to make the opposing side your enemy, and then they are depersonalized. They are people made in the image of God. The Imago Dei stamped on their heart. They have a soul that God is calling them to be reconciled to him in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Not through Islam, not through Judaism, but through Jesus Christ alone, okay? That is the answer, and that is what we need to get to them. What can you do? You can pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for both Palestinian and Jew. You can support organizations that God leads you to support. My wife Julie and I supported uh, a child through World Vision. World Vision is a reputable organization, and they help people both with, with their material needs and present the gospel in whatever ways they are capable of doing and whatever the local governments will allow. And so we specifically asked for a child in the, in the West Bank. West Bank and Gaza Strip are the two areas where the Palestinians um, are, are uh, located. And I wanted to understand the plate a little better. This was 10, 15 years ago. So don't depersonalize it. And however you can, not in violence, but reach out with the truth about who Jesus is. And once again, continue to pay for, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you. And uh, may we all stand against evil. I want to close with this last article piece uh, that I read this week and what is really the case about this entire uh, battle. We can never forget this is a spiritual battle. It says, at its core, this conflict is part of an epic unseen spiritual war that has raged since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. It's a war between good and evil, between God and Satan. The destiny of humanity and planet Earth itself hangs in the balance. The city of Jerusalem is ground zero in this epic war, and the Temple Mount is the coveted prize. Satan has attempted, through the use of successive Gentile powers, to either annihilate or assimilate them. And that truly is the core of the issue, and we have to uh, try to get people to understand that and uh, share the truth of who Christ is. Thank you very much.